get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Joseph Schriefer, he's a top direct response marketer at Agora Financial. We call him, he's sort of like a music producer, building brands and selling records while a celebrity sing. You cannot find Joseph on social media. You, I couldn't even find him anywhere on the internet except for one LinkedIn connection. So he's hard to track down. I'll tell you how I did. But in short, they Agora Financial, they have over 300,000 active paying subscribers, paying anywhere from $49 a year up to $5,000 a year for research and advice. He manages a team of 20 copywriters cranking out 100 promotions a year, and that's long form sales copy. And he reviews more than 400 pieces of copy and shoots down 60 to 70% of that. And he probably reads as much direct response marketing than anyone with competitors and, and what you guys produce. Joe, thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me, and hopefully, I'm able to deliver some value here. Yeah. Thanks. And so yeah, I want to thank our mutual friend, one of the top copywriting coaches, David Garfinkel, for introducing us. And he was saying how you are known among copywriters who write for you as having an uncanny knowledge of what your prospects think, what they like, what they don't like. So I wanted to hear from you. How do you get into the mind of your prospects? And maybe an example of one of those campaigns where you kind of did a deep dive into one of the, the minds of your prospects. Sure. So I think the first thing for it, it, to define in the, this context is going to be who our average customer is. And yeah. then I'll tell you uh, a little bit about how I think we get in that mindset of that customer. Yeah. So if you look at the financial direct response industry, um, we have created an avatar here at Agora Financial. Uh, I think you're going to be the first one outside of Agora Financial that I've ever told this to. But we tell it to all of our, our new copywriters and everything. And this avatar that we have created, we call him Bob. And we say, look, Bob is a 65-year-old dentist who has made money in his life. Yeah. He's a successful dentist pat practice. He's made some money, and at some point in Bob's life, he has went ahead and he's given that money to mainstream finance to manage. You know, he gave it to a broker. He gave it to a financial advisor. And typically what has happened is that financial advisor and that broker has not gotten Bob out of big wealth destroying moves before they happened. So if you look at the tech wreck, you know, of the late nineties, early two thousands, maybe Bob was involved in that because the broker didn't know enough to get Bob out of that. Right. So now Bob is jaded towards the mainstream. You know, Bob really doesn't trust mainstream finance. So at some point in Bob's head, he says, you know what? I was smart enough to make this money. I'm smart enough to manage this money. And Bob has taken his wealth back into his own hands and he's yeah. looking for alternative sources that he trusts. Um, to help him control that wealth. So that's who our avatar is. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we kind of find out is we say, okay, now now that we know who Bob is, where does Bob surf the internet? You know, where does Bob trust his news sources from? Yeah. I love where this is going. Yeah, go ahead. So what we do, of course, is we assume the role of Bob now that we know who he is. And, you know, he's very conservative in nature. That's what we believe. That's what he's reading on the internet. My so dad is a dentist, by the way, Joe, oh. just so you know. So I watched a video on the homepage on Agora Financial, and I'm like, these guys know exactly what they're doing. Is his name Bob? No, he's not. not Bob. <laughs> so that could have been our actual avatar. Yeah. So what we do is we go and we say, you know, where, what is Bob doing? What's he reading? What's he like? What's he watching? And then we have all of our, our new copywriters or any people that we're doing business with, we go and try to have them assume the role of Bob. So go ahead and, you know, watch Fox News, read the Drudge Report. Sign up for things like Newsmax's email list. You know, all the places that Bob is looking around for confirmation of his worldview or for uh, insights that he trusts. And that's the mind of Bob. So that's what we're going after. So if you look at that, um, that, that shapes our entire copy process. You know, it, it lets us know how saturated the market is for a particular idea. Yeah. So if we have an idea about selling the next coming financial crisis, we would already know how 
aware Bob might be of that crisis? Because we know, is Fox News covering that crisis? Is Bob reading about that crisis on the Drudge Report? Mm -hmm. And based on that, um, like we all probably know, you got Gene Schwartz's level of awareness curve. You know, we would say, how aware is Bob of this problem? Is he problem aware but solution unaware? Is he problem aware and solution aware? So we would know immediately how we want to capture Bob's attention based on what it is he or he does or doesn't know about this coming crisis. Yeah. So uh, there's another uh, I could geek out on. Go this ahead. One. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if anyone we has could not talk heard about Avid, you know, your process for a deep dive because I think this is one of the most important things. Um, when I was talking to David, and this, you know, David was like, "This is a question you need to ask Joe because." This is where the kind of the foundational principles come from. So yeah, just keep going. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of our secrets in the copywriting aren't actual copywriting tactics. You know, our biggest secret is making sure that the idea itself is the most compelling thing to Bob the avatar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we have new copywriters, it's much more about the formation of that idea to yeah. make sure that idea is new, new and unique and compelling and relevant. It's not so much you know, what to do on page 32 to the offer to increase response. We spend very little time on that. Mm -hmm. um, there is time spent on that, but not as much time as it is on the formation of this idea. Yeah. So again, you can't, unless you know, you know who that customer is and where that customer is shopping, what that customer is exposed to, what that customer is doing, until you know all of that, it's almost impossible to form that idea. So one other point on that, and, and again, this gets kind of geeky. Um, and I we don't want to geek out on direct response. Go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. I tell you what, I've had coffee this morning and no other things. So I'm a pretty wound up person in general. Okay. So if you just give me coffee and you speak to me in the morning and I'm already wound up. Perfect. Day, you know, insanely wound up. But anyway, um, there's a speech by Gary Bensylvania that I'm not sure how many people are aware of, but yeah. he tells yeah. the story. I think it was at the Pennsylvania 100 or something like that. So it's very tough to find. Yeah. But if, um, if people have seen this speech, uh, it would be fantastic if they haven't seen I have this. I have one of this. I don't know if you've seen this. I have uh... Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. One of my secret other. But yeah. the greatest part about that speech, and I'm not sure if you've heard this one, is he tells the story, and I'm going to screw this up, uh, so I'm telling it you know, very third hand here, but yeah. speech, go seek out this speech by Gary Bensmania and watch the actual original speech. But he tells the speech about this fisherman in Long Island. Have you heard this speech? Um, I may, I think so, but, but go ahead, yeah. So uh, general idea, and again, forgive me if I'm screwing this up, but Bensmania tells this idea about this fisherman in Long Island who every year would go out during fishing season and he had a tiny little boat and he as a one person fisherman with this tiny little boat and it was Captain Somebody, uh, a local legend, he would catch more fish than all of these big major fishing companies. And somewhere along the lines, a local newspaper reporter interviewed this little captain with this little boat with just a fishing rod and he said, how do you catch more fish than these big fishing companies? And he said, I go, I think like the way the fish think. You know, I think what times do they feed? How do they get hungry? At which depths do they swim? And everyone else thinks like fishermen. So I think like the fish, they think like fishermen. Mm -hmm. So they go and they buy these fancy GPS tracking things. And they go buy the best, you know, most expensive equipment. He said, all of those things just catch fishermen. They don't catch fish. So he just mm -hmm. studied the fish. He went to where the fish eat. He went to where the fish swim. Right. He thought about what um, you know temperatures the fish swim. So by thinking like the fish, right. he was able to catch more fish than everybody else. So that's a story that we always tell to our young copywriters: is again, yeah. you know, where do you find your, your your clients and your prospects? You have to assume the role of them uh, and and go everywhere that they're going on the internet and look how exposed they are to an idea. Yeah. So it's a very long-winded answer to a very short question. No, I I I expect long-winded answers, um, but. You know, David did tell me about a rare opportunity with Agora Financial, which I want to mention in a second. Um, but what has surprised you about the avatar that you wouldn't have known without doing that deep dive? Um, just how busy they are in life, you know, which in retrospect shouldn't be a surprise at all. Um, but our avatar specifically is incredibly, the market is incredibly saturated for, for that avatar's time. You know, we're competing with much more than what we ever thought we were going to compete with. It's not just that we're competing for Bob's time with financial advice. You know, again, you see those statistics that the average person might be exposed to two, three, four thousand advertisements a day with billboards and radio and TV and email. 
Um, so for us, the thing that surprised me is how, because the market is so saturated, we have to really push the envelope with our ideas to really gain attention for that customer's time. And again, this is, it shouldn't be surprising at all, but it always is surprising to me because we come out with ideas that I think are very relevant ideas for Bob. Yeah. And I'm just always surprised at how easily ignored our ideas are hmm. and how you know, strange we have to make our ideas to make them capture Bob's time. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, Bob doesn't want to read our stuff. Bob's not looking for our stuff in right. his day because he does have a lot of other sources competing for his attention. Right. Um, so somewhere in the back of his mind, he knows he wants to control his wealth. Yeah. Uh, and he knows he has to do it for the strength of his retirement. But he's not looking for us. It's not a privilege to read our stuff. You know, we really have to disrupt his day right. uh, in a new, unique way. Yeah to gain his time. So again, it shouldn't be surprising, but it always is surprising. That's us. interesting, Joe. And so on that note, what is something you thought, this is just going to blow it out of the water and they completely ignored it. And then what was, and how you kind of, I don't know, tweaked it to make that, that strange idea that they actually looked at? Um, there are a lot of ideas we could probably go through <laughs> where I think they're going to just kill it. And then they land in Bob's email box and he completely ignores it, never opens it, anything like that. Um, let me try to think of, uh, uh, okay, so I'll give you an idea here. Yeah. Um, we have a, a couple technology letters that, uh, they're research letters. They show you how to profit from the latest moves in the technology industry. Yeah. There is a radical new development going on in cancer therapy called immunotherapy. So if, if anyone's watching the news, Jimmy Carter, a couple weeks ago, probably 16 weeks ago or something like that, announced that he had... Um, melanoma, I guess, that had metastasized and, and ended up putting some lesions on his brain. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty dire straits. Yeah. Um, that was 16 weeks ago. The other day in Sunday school, when Jimmy Carter was teaching his normal Sunday school class, he said, you know, I got a major announcement. I'm now cancer free. So Jimmy Carter went from having what I believe to be stage three or stage four cancer 16 weeks ago wow. to being effectively cured of cancer right now. So how did he do it, right? He didn't get chemotherapy. I think you have to sign up for a Gore Financial to find out. No, I'm just <laughs> he had this thing administered called immunotherapy. Yeah. And immunotherapy is a massive blockbuster that's going on in um, the biotech world right now. Yeah. So we effectively what it does without getting too you know, nerdy or anything like that is you take your own immune system and teach your own immune system how to fight cancer more aggressively. Mm -hmm. So it's a modified version of your own immune system. It's not like chemotherapy where unfortunately, you know, all of us know somebody that's been through chemotherapy and you see the devastating effects of chemotherapy. Right. Chemotherapy poisons your entire body, including the healthy cells. Yeah. Immunotherapy is training your immune system, which is the most powerful system you have in your body, to attack these cancer cells in a more aggressive way, uh, way to identify and attack them. Yeah. So long story short, we have written some immunotherapy um, promotions that would show you the best immunotherapy companies to buy to mm. increase your wealth as this new technology takes hold in the cancer industry. Wow. So it's, it's something that personally I find very, very interesting yeah. because literally we are on the cusp of a major cancer breakthrough. And if you, from a wealth perspective, can identify those companies that are developing immunotherapy drugs and invest in them early, you can make a fortune. Yeah, it's an idea I'm very passionate about. It's an yeah. idea that Bob did not care anything about. <laughs> yeah. maybe we just didn't write it up in the in the proper way. They didn't care anything about that. I'm sorry. They didn't care about that at all. They didn't care about it, and I think what happens is, you know, we always hear about this idea of the curse of knowledge. Uh, for us specifically, we researched immunotherapy from top to bottom. I mean, we have done tons of research. We've looked at all the clinical trials, and the way that we position that in a piece of promotional copy to get Bob to stop his life, to pay attention to us, to understand that we think we have a wealth way for you to grow your wealth by investing in these immunotherapy companies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I think we had the curse of knowledge and didn't understand what it was like for Bob just to be watching Fox News and have his day interrupted with this, this immunotherapy uh, story. We just were too deep in the weeds and it was an idea that I thought was really going to work, but we got into the science way too heady and uh, we just forgot what it was like to know, not to know anything about that immunotherapy. So mm -hmm. we talked to Bob like he was aware of immunotherapy. We talked to Bob 
Like he wanted immunotherapy stocks. And I don't think at the end of the day he did. What he wanted to do was just grow his wealth. And he was looking for a new interesting way to do it. So immunotherapy is one. But that, it is a compelling story, what you told. It is. It's compelling. But we haven't found the right way to tell it to people yet. Hmm. Um, we just haven't found a way to interrupt their busy day and say, look, here is a true breakthrough. And here's what's happening. And here's how you can make your money. Yeah. So it's an idea that I'm still passionate about, that I'm convinced will work. Yeah. But right now, we haven't made it work because we haven't found out the right way to tell that story. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Joe, for that, do you scrap it like it didn't work? Or do you go back and rework it? What's your process after something you find didn't work as well as you, you thought it would? Yeah, so we are not scrapping that idea at all. You know, I'm still convinced that it is a story that needs to be spread, um, yeah. both from a health perspective and from a wealth perspective. But we just haven't found the right way to tell it. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is, what my plan is, is I would like to write immunotherapy promotions mm -hmm. until we succeed. Because I'm confident, confident mm -hmm. that it is gaining more attention every day in people's lives. Because again, you know, they just ran a big um, story on Jimmy Carter on you know, the nightly news with Lester Holt about how he was cured with immunotherapy. Yeah. Like level of awareness for Bob is going to be inching up by the day. So at some point we hit that tipping point yeah. and I want to make sure that we're there with a promotion when that tipping point occurs. Yeah. So I can go back to the drawing board with our copywriting team and I'm going to make sure that we write six different, seven different immunotherapy promotions over the course of the next year or six months. Because again, I'm confident that the core of that promotion is going to work. Yeah. It's just how do we communicate that to Bob right now based on his level of awareness on what this this new idea is. Yeah. Uh, so I'm convinced it's going to work. We're just going to go back to the drawing board and find new interesting ways to say it. What we did just do is we did just take the Jimmy Carter story that is getting some attention and we're putting that as our headline and lead to the promotion. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you the, the specific promotion earlier in this year yeah. um, was a promotion that we came out with immunotherapy called Eye Cells and it looked like the iPhone, little I, capital C, E, M, L, S. And the idea was they were intelligent cells. So we were calling them eye cells. So we were taking your own immune system, making it more intelligent by able to recognize cancer. Yeah. So the yeah. eye cells idea did not work as well as I wanted it to. Uh, who knows, right? I was trying to play on Apple's success with that branding of iPhone, iPad. I was calling it eye cells. So that one didn't work. What we're doing is we're going to put a new headline and lead on that based on Jimmy Carter's story. And the new promotion that's about to go out is called Carter's Jimmy Carter's 16-Week Cancer Miracle how we went from having whatever it might be, stage three, stage four cancer, to being completely cancer-free in as little as 16 weeks and how it could be the wealth story of your lifetime. Yeah. Um, the most amazing part of that is now we have before and after scans from people who have been administered by with immunotherapy treatment. And it's just amazing. I mean, you could look at their bodies uh, riddled with more than 200 cancer tumors before treatment, and then now we have an after x-ray that that's come out that we're using in our promotion. That's 22 weeks later, for this particular person wow. with cancer anywhere in their body. That's and that's amazing. just utterly amazing without ever having to go through chemotherapy. Yeah. So we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep trying. So the Jimmy Carter story is going to be used as a headline and lead. Um, we're going to try another new headline and lead uh, after that. So again, until it hits, I'm convinced that is an idea that is going to work. And I'm convinced that it's the we're still before that tipping point. Yeah. You thought you, know? you were too early, maybe. I'm sorry? You thought you were too early in addition. Exactly. Yeah. It was too early and we may have not told the story in the right way. Maybe it just didn't hit the vein of what uh, you know Bob was interested in at the time. So I'm convinced the story that's going to sell and we're going to make it, we're going to keep reworking it. Um, yeah. Either we're going to sit here a year from now and you and I could talk again and I could say, I'm gravely wrong. It never worked. You know, it was terrible, terrible use of our time. Um, but I'm convinced that we sit here from a year from now and we've got something that's working for that idea, but it's not going to be... Uh, you, you know, we're going to have to spend a couple bullets to make it work. Yeah. We're going to have to shoot the gun a couple times yeah. to try to see if we hit the mark. Yeah, I have about 50 questions based off of what you just said. But yeah. um, I'll ask the one, the post-mortem. How do you decide what to change? Like, let's say it didn't work because of the headline. I mean, was it, how do you know if it's something simple or it's really we need to rework the, the whole story? Sure. So we never know. Um, you know, what we do know is we always start with that headline and lead so as direct marketers, you know, we all know that the most important thing we could start with is what's trying to capture that reader's attention. Yeah. So we always start, when we rework stories, we always start with the headline and then we go on to the lead. Um, you know, we might mess with the body copy of the promotion. 
but it's going to be later down the line. So if anything's not working, it's typically 99% of the time in our business, if something didn't work, it's because that thing didn't get attention or didn't have enough believability to get you to read pay, past page two of our mm-hmm. approach. Mm-hmm. So we can never pinpoint you know, exactly why we think it didn't work. We could just make a guess, an educated guess, um, and then start with the headline lead to try to rework the story from that point. So you, you know, the way that I look at our business and the thing I tell our, our young copywriters, one of the most frustrating parts, I think, about the direct response business is if something doesn't work, you really never know why it didn't work. You never have closure. So right. it's like in a relationship and being broken up with and never getting closure. You know, was, <laughs> I, was I too mean to that person? Did I not buy them flowers enough? You know, did they not like the way that uh, I dressed? You know, whatever it might yeah. be. It's like being broken up with and yeah. never getting closure. That's the way I feel when promotions don't work. Right. And that's hard for our, a, lot of, a lot of our young copywriters to overcome yeah. because yeah. they are looking for the silver bullet of this is why it didn't work and this is how to make it work. Right. For right. our industry, specifically the financial publishing industry, we never have that. You know, the best thing is we can do a postmortem, like you're saying, and say, here's why we think it didn't work. So yeah. let's change these elements in the headline and lead based let's on that. Test it. And let's test it again. Yeah. And let's test it four different ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, and at the point that we've exhausted all testing, we're not going to give up on an idea that we believe in. Yeah. So on the flip side of things, Joe, what about something that did succeed in some of the elements? Yep. What's one of your so, favorite campaigns? Uh, I'll tell you about an idea that I didn't think was going to succeed, yes. and that did ended up succeeding. Yeah. Um, Some part of you had to think it was going to succeed because you approved it, right? Yeah, I, I didn't think it was going to bomb. <laughs> That's okay. My, okay. It's another kind of secret, the way I believe about our business at Agora Financial, yeah. um, is that I think I can identify an idea that is terrible. An idea that is decent to great, I've got no success with. You okay. know, when I, it's decent to, to great. I just let go and let the market decide. Okay. Because I think anyone specifically in the financial direct response industry that would be arrogant enough to tell you that they could spot every great idea yeah. is just a complete liar. Right. You know, I think the best you can get to with your career within direct financial response is just to spot terrible ideas, but right. you let the mediocre to good ones to great ones just go yeah. and let the market decide. Yeah. Because yeah, there are certain ideas that I'm still radically surprised by. Um, either from a good or bad perspective. You know, uh, if there's an idea that I think is good, an idea that I think will be good and beneficial to our reader, an idea that I think is executed decently, yeah. I'm going to let it go out there. Right. And, uh, and, and we'll let the market decide. Okay. So give me a specific idea of that. Yeah. Um, everybody was, again, this is really specific to the financial publishing. Yeah, industry, go ahead. Everybody was enthralled with Bitcoin a couple of years ago. Sure, yeah. You know, digital currency that's untracked by governments, um, things like that. And Bitcoin went on this just meteoric rise, you know, from like, uh, I don't know what it was, 30 cents per Bitcoin up to like $1,300 per Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin was at like six or 700 bucks, we saw the frenzy that was going on Bitcoin and we wanted to write a Bitcoin promotion. So at that point though, we said, you know what, Bob on Fox News doesn't really know about Bitcoin yet or doesn't really care about Bitcoin. Right. So we're not going to be direct with the idea. So we want to transubstantiate this idea. We want to turn this idea into something else that might seem more compelling. So the idea that we wrote up was something like White House terrified by creation of underground banking system. Okay. So while everyone else is putting their money into pay nothing savings accounts, there's a whole new banking system that's allowing people to radically grow their money at clips never seen before. And then we had some testimonials of people who had bought Bitcoin. So you didn't even know it was a Bitcoin promotion until page 13 of our sales letter. How long was the sales letter? Probably 30, 30, 30 pages. pages. Okay. So literally at the halfway point, we finally said, what is this? <laughs> system? Well, it's Bitcoin. But we knew we couldn't lead with Bitcoin because Bob doesn't really care about Bitcoin. Right. What Bob did care about is that he had money in a savings account that was paying nothing right. because of the Federal Reserve's interest rate policy. You know, as we all know, the Federal Reserve has punished savers right now yeah. to try to encourage spending and growth in the United States economy. Yeah. So Bob does not like that. You know, Bob does not like that he's been punished for doing the right thing and saving his money, and he's earning 0.2% on his money a year. So we thought that if we could play up the idea that the White House was terrified of this underground banking system because it was allowing people to get outside the dollar 
and grow their money at clips faster than they've ever seen. Yeah. We thought that was a compelling enough idea. So we, I thought it was an okay idea. I thought it was a decent idea. Um, because we have so much promotional copy within Agora Financial, you know, we're not one of those businesses that can write a promotion today and get it out tomorrow. There are processes in our business right now. There's a legal compliance review. Uh, you know, we do have a lot of promotions going through our production department to turn into video sales letters. So I prioritize that promotion kind of low in the process. So it took us like a month and a half to get that promotion out. And then the promotion went out and we were bringing in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new subscribers a day on that promotion. Wow. So that surprised me to the upside. I thought it was a decent enough idea. I didn't think it was going to do anything fantastic, but it ended up doing fantastic. And it brought in, uh, I don't know what it might have been, 20, 30,000 paying subscribers for us wow. who subsequently went on to buy some of our high-priced products. And it was a very successful promotion. But yeah. It was one that I thought was okay enough Yeah, it turned into a, 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 not a blockbuster, but it turned into a good promotion. Right. Like I said, I could go on, I would go for 35 hours straight and just have you, those 400 things you reviewed, just break down every one of them, but we have five minutes. So, um, Joel, there's two things I want to talk about. I don't know if we'll have time for them, but the idea of scaling a business, the good and the bad. And um, David was mentioning, I think it's okay for me to say there's a rare opportunity that you're actually looking for copywriters um, who will come to work at Agora Financial Headquarters. Yep. So I want you to talk about that opportunity and then also w about what you look for in a copywriter. Sure. Um, which way do you want to go? Do you want me yeah, to go with the, Yeah, go with the, um, you're looking for copywriters first. What's the opportunity look like? And we'll go into some of the hiring process and what you look for. Yep, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to try to tackle both of those, the scaling the business yeah. and the looking for at the same time. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we're at a point in our business where we're not going to make any slight tweaks to our business to make a massive success to our bottom line. I mean, we're a pretty large direct response business. Huge, right? yeah. So the difference in our business right now, the way that we scale our business, is that I want to build our business and work with the people who are the smartest people I can find. Yeah. Because that's the X factor, as we all know, to scaling the business. If I could find one great partner to work with who's smart, who's dedicated, who's interested in direct response, I know I can make that relationship beneficial for all parties involved. Mm -hmm. I know I could make that person effectively rich through a copywriting royalty. I know I can make a board of financial a lot more money, and I know I can better Bob's life because I'm gonna put better ideas in front of him. Yeah. So the way that I believe we scale a board of financial to the next level is that I'm always looking to work with superstars. Yeah. And again, I, I believe that that relationship is going to be beneficial for all parties. Yeah. So you know, what is a superstar that we're looking for? Yeah. I'm looking for superstar copywriters, and I'm looking for superstar marketers slash traffic drivers. Um, the hiring process, you know, we're a pretty unique company. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you really can't find me on the internet, right? So Not I'm at all. A ghost marketer in that point. Yeah. You know, I don't care about resumes. I don't have a resume. You and I were talking before this call, and you said you found an old LinkedIn page that I had that I had one connection. <laughs> and I told you that I haven't updated my LinkedIn page in 15 years because I'm not looking for a job. Right. So our hiring process is weird and it's unique. You know, I don't care about a resume. So, so if anyone's interested, don't don't send me a resume. I don't care about it. I care more about who that person is. I care more about the relationship that I would have with that person. And I believe I can learn a lot more in talking with people who are interested in the opportunity than I could looking at someone's resume, yeah. which I just don't care about. So the hiring process is weird, right? The hiring process is number one, um, again, just to, to put it out there of who I'm looking for, is I'm looking for people that are really smart and really want to work hard and build a business with us mm -hmm. and think that that's fun. So that's a really weird job description because it's not like I'm going to say you have to come in from nine to five and write this or write six promotions a year. I'm just looking for really smart, dedicated people. The second thing is just get in touch with me, and, and we cover about how to do that in a second. Yeah. So literally, if someone is interested, um, send me an email and say, hey, I'm interested. And I'll, again, I'll cover the email thing in just a second. Um, and then the third is that we just begin a personal conversation. So I'll call them up on the phone if I think they're interesting. Um, the best thing is they should capture my attention in that email if they're interesting. If they're a good copywriter, they, they should, right? <laughs> Tell me something weird. Tell me something unique. You know, don't start an email that says, I graduated from so-and-so university in 2005 and I'm looking to work. You know, don't, I'm not going to read that. Just like our customer, Bob, is not going to read something that he doesn't care about in his life. I'll give them a good subject line. Just say, I'm a big believer in the right to own guns 
And Maybe. I know the legal loophole. Yeah, and that is that is Joe's fun fact, which we don't have time to get into. But but go on. Sure. So uh, let me give you. I'm going to give you my personal email address. Yeah. Uh, because it is hard. Are you to sure find. about that? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure about that. Okay. It's dangerous, but I'm sure about that. It is. Uh, my so again, my full name Joe Schriefer, and my email address is J Schriefer at agorafinancial.com, which is J S is in Sam C H R I E F is in Frank. ER at agorafinancial.com. Mm-hmm. So talk about training, you yeah. know, because you guys, again, um, as, as David Garfinkel says, it's like the Super Bowl of direct response. Like it's, you're in the most competitive space. How do you train those new uh, copywriters or copywriters who are new to you? Sure. I think the best thing for our training process is because we have a large copywriting team that is here in Baltimore, yeah. um, we almost crowdsource our training process. Hmm. So the best thing for someone to get trained is to spend time here in Baltimore with us and learn from not only myself, but from the rest of the copywriting team and the rest of the marketing team. So I basically, the, the first step of the training is that we have someone come to Baltimore. The best situation would be that they live in Baltimore here with us. Um, and then they just spend a considerable amount of time at the early part of their career here in Baltimore in our copywriting room. Yeah. They will learn more in that room than any agenda of books I can give them. Yeah. So we do give them a list of books, you know, read all the big classic books, read breakthrough advertising, read the copywriter's handbook, you know, uh, if you're a marketer, go get Google AdWords certified. Yeah. But the intangible part of the process is literally just sitting in a room with 19 other yeah. copywriters who are incentivized to figure out how to communicate with our customer and who are constantly reading everything else that our competitors put out. Yeah. So that's the other kind of final, final part of the process. Step number one, read some books. Step number two, crowdsource, find uh, time to be in Baltimore to learn from our team. And step number three, uh, and again, this is a Pennsylvania trick, I believe, which is just you read a promotion every single day. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's financial promotion, doesn't matter if it's internet marketing promotion. You know, to get that rhythm of what does good copy sound like? Yeah. And to read bad copy too, to read bad copy that you know is bombed because what does bad copy sound like? Well, you know, what elements are that, is that particular sales piece missing that we think could have made it better? So just to read a lot of copy. Yeah. Uh, that's all, I don't think, literally we have hired people with Harvard MBAs and we've had to fire them. Yeah. We have yeah. hired people that have never went to high school or didn't finish high school, didn't finish college, who've yeah. radically succeeded. Yeah. And that's why I don't care about resumes because there's nothing on a resume that would point me to saying this person would be a success in our relationship together. Yeah. You know, what does is just the conversation that we would have. And I think I would learn more, again, in that type of way. If someone emailed me and captured my attention, um, those are the type yeah. of people I would like to work yeah. with. So, Joe, I respect your time. I know we're three minutes over, so I know you have uh, 200, you know, 200 promotions to read today. Um, so <laughs> I appreciate your time. What's up? I'm supposed to have a meeting now, but someone has not come knocking on my office door yet. All so right. if we could just continue for Let's a continue until they knock and they say, okay, we'll, we'll keep going. Great. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. So, so idea of scaling business, what's yeah. the good part and the bad part? Yeah. So the idea of the scaling the business, and uh, this is a book that one of the uh, kind of co-founders of Agora wrote. It's a book called Ready, Fire, Aim. Yeah. And if people have Michael not- Michael Masterson. Read, yeah. Exactly. That's a fantastic book. Because what it does is it lays out in the stage of growth of business um, what problems and opportunities you're going to have as you grow a business. Yeah. So Agora Financial is a you know pretty well established business, and I could tell you uh, you know roughly been here for 13 years. Again, it's been really my only job other than retail that I've ever had, and I could tell you how different the business has been in the past 13 years. If you rewind the clock and you yeah. look at Agora Financial's business 13 years ago, we probably had 20 people that we're trying to grow the business. Now we have a hundred. Wow. And you know, getting big hits that make a huge impact in gross revenue are much harder now than what they were when we were a 20 person business. Right. So when we were a 20 person business, we could have one promotion that could double our business. Um, when now that we're much larger than that, we need a lot of promotions that continue to sustain that big business. Mm -hmm. So uh, anybody that wants to learn about how to scale a business, you know, when you're young and you're, you're a business that's just getting started, the most aggressive thing that you could do is create new products and new promotions. 
and constantly be cranking that, that process out. Yeah. Um, when you grow a business, of course, it compounds with all these other problems. Like when you add 100 people to the mix, you have 100 different personalities. So, you, so the opportunities and the challenges with the business get different. You need to put real management in place because without real management, it will be chaos to have 100 people rolling around trying to figure out direct response. So what happens is it's easy to get lost in the management structure of the business as the business grows, but you still have to try to maintain that originality of a small growing business to continue to create new products and new promotions. So it's that tension of scaling a business that can be very, very good because the gross revenue numbers look good when they're going up, but it presents problems and challenges that I think people need to know that they're going to face later on in life um, as that business continues to grow. The person who started the business may not be the person who wants to manage the business when it grows because they're going to lose creativity and they're going to gain all types of management problems that they have to deal with. So the idea of knowing and anticipating uh, you know, where, that, where that business is going to be in a couple of years and making sure that you have the people in place to manage a growing business so that you can still, as the founder, focus on creativity, focus on creating products while not having to deal with the day-to-day -day BS, mm -hmm. I think is a really important point. So the good is that, of course, the numbers are getting bigger, the business is getting bigger, you're scaling the business, that's the very good. The bad is that if you don't anticipate the challenges that are gonna come with a bigger growing business, uh, the business will eat itself with problems. Yeah. Um, so for anybody who has not read that book, Ready, Fire, Aim, fantastic book, because really it does lay out that foundation of how to deal with the next stage of growth. Yeah. So how did you get into direct response? Uh, totally by accident, which is I'm sure how most people would really find their, their way in. Like what uh, did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to make movies. That's what I really wanted okay. to do. Um, you know, I had this vision uh, very young, and I don't know why, but uh, I wanted to go to NYU and study film. That's what I wanted to do. Instead, I stayed local uh, to, a, to a, a college here in Baltimore named Towson University. And I didn't know what I wanted to do because I didn't really have a film program at that point. So I didn't go away to NYU like I wanted to. I stayed here in Baltimore and I had some mass communications degree. And then I got out of, to college and I said, I don't even know what a mass communications degree really is. What does that even really mean? And I interviewed with a couple different, um, uh, a couple different companies when I was like 22 years old. And one was a physician's marketing assistant. To this day, I still don't know what that job actually was, but it sounded cool and I got to work for a doctor. So I wanted that job. And then I interviewed at another job. I can't even remember what it was. And then I interviewed at Agora Financial. Oh, really? And then I walked, I came, went home that day and I was still living with my parents because I was just out of college. And I remember telling them like, hey, I really want this physician's job. I don't have any clue what this other job is at Agora. And Agora was the only one out of the three that offered me a job. And I, I didn't even know what Agora did. And they, you know, my salary was $25,000 a year. And I thought that was... Uh, a terrible starting salary because I had this stupid idea that I was supposed to make all this more money and you know typical young right exactly college kid. But Agora was the only one that offered me a job and I took it and uh, for like six months I had no clue what we were doing <laughs> literally no clue. I just knew that we had a big list of customers and we were writing financial stuff and sending it out. So it was like what was your job what at the time? I was managing database at the time. Okay. So because we have all these customers, you know, we do rent out our direct mail lists. Yeah. So if anyone wanted to come to Agora Financial and rent a portion of our names, 5,000 of our names to mail our customers their direct mail piece, I was literally the guy that was querying the database mm. to pull those customers' names. Yeah. And I'd go home every day and I'd go, like my parents would say, what'd you do today? And I'd say, I don't know. I ran these queries to the database and I sent 50,000 names to a merge purge company. Like, I didn't even know, you know, no clue what I was doing. But what I did know is that Agora offers the atmosphere that it's a very libertarian type of atmosphere where you can make your own fate. So if you want to try new things, if you want to do new things, it gives you the freedom to do it mm -hmm. and either to seek uh, the rewards that it offers or to risk failure. So I just started trying new things and I met some new interesting people who gave me chances that I should have never been given chances at that young. What was the chance that you were given that help launch your career there. sure so uh early on uh, you know probably two years after my time at agora i knew i loved agora but i knew i hated this database work right uh, and i met a gentleman who had founded agora financial his name is addison wiggin he's a three-time new york times best-selling author i think i saw one paragraph where you wrote on the internet about him somewhere <laughs> yeah. yeah so if you if you you're gonna find addison a lot more than you're gonna find me on the internet because he's the face of agora financial and he's yeah. the founder of agora financial a special note it's americanfreepress.net yes 
So uh, Addison gave me a chance because, you know, Gore Financial was just getting started and was growing at the time. Um, and Addison said, here, you go make the mistakes, run the business from a day-to-day -day perspective, um, because he wanted to concentrate on the big ideas and he wanted to write the New York Times bestselling books. And he made a, a documentary that got accepted into Sundance called IO USA in 2008. So he wanted to concentrate on those big ideas. Right. And he, you know, what he wanted to do is set someone up to run the business to make sure that the business functioned. Again, you know, the idea of the scaling business. He didn't want to manage the business and work on the big ideas because he knew he couldn't at the same time. So very, very smart in that way that he gave he said, hey, you're 26, 27 years old. Go run the business. I trust you. Let me know if there's problems. <laughs> I've never been given that chance. I made a ton of mistakes. What were some of the mistakes early on? Oh, geez. I mean, I made management mistakes. I made stupid product mistakes. So I, I give you a, a dumb little mistake that I made that's, you know, didn't hurt the business, but it did distract me in time. I had this stupid idea that I thought we could create a refer a friend program and acquire customers at effectively a zero dollar cost per acquisition. And I thought that was going to be the next big thing. I thought, you know, why do we not have a refer a friend program for Agora Financial? So I worked on that. Uh, sorry, I'm going to, I just got the notion that I got to go ahead. Of, That's cool. That's a great story. Yeah. So I worked on that idea and, you know, it, it took a lot of development time to get a refer a friend program. Uh, and I spent too much time on that idea and it just bombed. So I don't know why it ever bombed. My guess is that like religion, politics, and finance, there are just certain things you probably don't want to refer your friends to. <laughs> and I think that no one wanted to refer their friend to a financial newsletter that could potentially either make them money or lose them money because then they'd have a terrible conversation of, oh, you referred me to that thing that lost me money, right? right. So it's just terrible and stupid and bombed. And I spent a lot of our time, a lot of my time, a lot of our development time yeah. where it should have just been finding a new idea that I thought Bob would be more interested in and testing it quickly. Yeah. And either failing quickly or succeeding quickly. Yeah. So again, it's like it's a very acute little problem right there. Yeah. I can tell you a hundred more stories about much larger problems of management. I know you have someone waiting, um, so I will let you go to that meeting, um, and maybe we will continue this conversation at uh, another time if uh, your time allows. But uh, Joe, thank you so much Absolutely. for sharing some of the insider secrets, some of the behind the scenes at Agora, and uh, really appreciate your time. Can I repeat my email address? One yeah, more go time? ahead. I have it. Uh, yeah. J S C, and I'll, I can link it even there. J S C H R I E F E R at agorafinancial.com. Correct. Yeah, so, that is write a compelling freaking subject line so Joe yeah. actually cares about what you're gonna to say. And uh, yeah, anything? Any final words? No, again, I just, you know, I, I am a nerd for this type of business, and I love working with people that are passionate, that have new, interesting things to say. So even if someone emails me and we can't figure out a business relationship together, um, you know, it's a very small industry, right? And I love having friends, and I think that there are often times that I could share some things that might help that person, and in exchange, I believe that that person could probably help me and Agora Financial. So even if... There's no professional business relationship to be had right now. Um, reach out if someone's interested, and I run a very transparent business. I'm willing to share almost anything that we're doing right now wow. because I believe as the That's business, you. Yeah. as the industry grows, we're all going to grow in that type of way. Yeah. So uh, that would be the other thing: is you know anybody that's listening, uh, you want to talk about direct response? I'm always happy to do so. Shoot me an email. We'll find out if there's a way that we can work together. Yeah. Awesome, Joe. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time.